Welcome back to The Science Basement, your source for videos that are entertaining and educational. This is part two on a series of videos about introduction to soils. How many of us really understand what soil is? I want you to imagine for a moment that you reach down and pick up a handful of soil. Do you really know what you're holding, what's in it, what it's composed of? Most people think of soil as really being just solid material, just crushed up rocks that are really small. But in reality, that solid portion or that mineral portion accounts for less than half of that handful, only 45%. The remainder of what you're holding is in equal parts of water and air. Each is about 25%. And lastly, there's usually an average of about 5% organic matter. Within that mineral fraction or the solid fraction of the soil, there are different particle sizes. And I'm sure these terms will be familiar to you. There is sand, silt, and clay. These particles are defined by their different sizes. Sand ranges in size from 2 to 0 0.05 millimeters, silt from 0 0.05 to 0 0.002 millimeters, and clay is anything less than 0 0.002 millimeters. It's really hard to put these into perspective because clay particles are so, so small. In fact, over 50 million of the biggest particles of clay could fit in a single grain of sand. It's really hard to put that into perspective, so let's take a look at our own solar system. The sun has a diameter of 864,948 miles. It's huge. Now when you look at that compared to our own moon, the moon has a diameter of about 2,159 miles, and 64 million Earth moons would fit inside the sun. So, if the sun was a grain of sand, then some of the largest particles of clay would be about the size of our moon. I really hope that puts into perspective how small clay particles really are. The different ratios of sand, silt, and clay make up the texture of the soil. Soil scientists use this texture triangle as a way to classify soils based on the different ratios. I know that this texture triangle looks a bit scary at first, but really it's not that bad. The best way to learn how to use it is to practice. Look up some texture triangle pictures on the internet and try it out. There is no one best component. In fact, any time that you have soils that consist of too much sand, silt, or clay, you tend to have problems, whether that's problems with nutrients, water, or something else. The best soils have a good mix of all three and are called loams. As we go up in scale, we have soil structure. Soil structure is how the soils arrange themselves. So the particles will stick together and form what are called aggregates. And you can have several different kinds of aggregates that form. The first is no aggregates at all or single grain. So each individual soil grain is by itself. They're not glued together in any way. Then you can have granular structure, which are small groupings of soil particles. Blocky structure is usually larger. It has bigger cracks in between the aggregates. Then you have prismatic, which form almost column-like structures in the soil. And one of the worst is platy, when the soil will form aggregates that are almost like plates stacked on top of each other. And these soils are very bad about letting water infiltrate into the soil and about allowing roots to really penetrate and grow down. Aggregates can form in several different ways, and they're primarily formed by living organisms like soil fungi, bacteria, and plant roots. They exude materials that glue soil particles together. Aggregates are very important for soils because they can help prevent erosion, make nutrients more accessible, and allow water to infiltrate into the soil more easily and make water more available for plants. Moving up in scale again, we have what's called a soil profile. A soil profile is a bit like a mugshot for soils because it allows you to see the different layers. Each layer has a name, and they're called horizons. The very first layer, or horizon, is the O-horizon. This usually isn't considered soil yet, and in fact the best way to think of this horizon is as organic matter. It's typically composed of decaying plant material like leaves, roots, and sticks, and it's typically characterized by a dark color. The next horizon is the A-horizon, and this is what most people know of as topsoil. Again, it has a darker color because of the addition of organic matter from above. The next layer below the A-horizon is the B-horizon, which a lot of people call subsoil, but in reality, it's called a zone of accumulation. This is where materials like clay collect in the soil profile from the movement of water downward. The next horizon is the sea horizon, and this horizon is typically characterized by a lighter color, maybe even an increased presence of rocks, and in a lot of situations is known as the parent material, or what the soil originally formed from. In some cases, beneath the sea horizon, you can have the R horizon, which a lot of people know of as bedrock. When the bedrock is present in the soil profile, it would be called the parent material, or the material that this soil originally formed from. And of course, there are many, many different types of soils. Just imagine going on a road trip anywhere. It doesn't even need to be across the country. It could be within your own state or your own city. You'll notice soils that have different colors or support different plants or just have different qualities in general. At the very top of soil classification or soil taxonomy, there are 12 soil orders, alphasols, andesols, aridosols, entosols, 
Jellisols, histosols, inceptosols, molosols, oxisols, spotosols, ultosols, and vertisols. They all have different qualities and form in different areas. While knowing these different soil orders could be useful if you have a career in soils, ultimately I think the biggest take-home message is that there is variability in soils. They vary spatially. When you look at a map of the United States, you can see that there are different regions where these soils are found. And even within a state, there could be many different types of soil orders found there. At a local level, within each soil order, soils can be further broken down into soil series. In Kansas, for example, you might find the Eudora silt loam or the Summit silty clay loam. If you're curious about the different types of soils that can be found in your area and their qualities, the best place to find this information is the NRCS Web Soil Survey, which is available online. Because soils are variable, you want to do what's called soil sampling before you plant a garden or before you farm. A lot of times if you're standing in your yard or a field, the soil that you're standing on could be completely different than soil that's just a few feet away. To sample soil, use what's called a soil probe, which is basically a pole with a hole at the end and a bucket for the soil to go into. The hole at the end is sharpened and as you push the probe into the soil, the soil will enter the bucket and be held there. The soil that enters the bucket of the probe is called a soil core. The depth you need to sample to depends on the nutrient they're looking for and also the lab that's going to be processing these samples. Most of the time, a 6 inch sample is sufficient. However, if you're sampling for a farming operation, a lot of times you'll need to sample down to 24 inches because you'll be looking for nitrogen, which is a mobile nutrient and can be found deeper in the soil profile. So how many samples do you need to take? This is a function of statistics, because the more samples that you take, the better that your samples will represent an average of the field. Usually it's recommended that you take about 12 to 15 cores and mix these together in a bucket to make what's called a composite sample. If you're sampling down to 24 inches, you want to separate these out into two different composites and have two different buckets, one for each. In one bucket, you'll put the 0 to 6 inch samples. Again, you'll have about 12 to 15 cores and you'll mix these together. And then the other bucket will be for your 6 to 24 inch sample. You'll send these composites to the lab individually. Why would you need to do this? Well, in the 0 to 6 inch sample, you're looking for different nutrients like phosphorus and potassium, which are non-mobile nutrients. But nitrogen, since it's mobile, will be found deeper in the profile. If you were to calculate phosphorus and potassium concentrations based on a 24 inch sample, your concentrations wouldn't be right and your fertilizer recommendation would be wrong. When it comes to actually soil sampling, there are three different methods that you can use. Whole field sampling, zone sampling, and grid sampling. There is no one best method. It really depends on the field that you're sampling and what you're really looking for. Whole field sampling is best when you're looking for an average for a whole field, like when a field doesn't have very much soil variability. For this type of sampling, you'll take 12 to 15 cores at random through the field, usually in a W-shaped pattern. You'll then take these 12 to 15 cores and composite them into a bucket and send them to a lab. Zone sampling is best when you know that there is some variability in a field, like where one side of a field might be different than another. This could be for several reasons. One could be that you know that there's a difference in soil series between one side of a field and another, or it could be differences in topography, or because one side of a field has ponding or water issues. The idea with zone sampling is that you'll know that you'll want to treat these areas of the field differently. So to do a zone sampling, you'll first identify zones in a field, and this could be as many zones as you want. And then in each field, you'll take 12 to 15 cores at random following a W-shaped pattern and composite them together for each zone and send those zone samples separately to a lab. The last method is grid sampling, which is the most precise, but it also requires the most amount of time and can cost the most amount of money for soil analysis. Grid sampling is especially useful if you want to make a map or do precision agriculture. To do grid sampling, you overlay a grid on your field. Each square can represent any size of your choice. It could be 1 acre, 2 acres, 5 acres, 10 acres. It all depends on the resolution that you want in your map. Then you go to each intersect in the field, and then in a 10-foot radius around that point, you'll take 12 to 15 cores at random and make a composite sample. Just in this example alone, you'll have 42 different composite samples, which would represent about 630 cores. So you can imagine how this would be very time consuming and also very expensive when it comes time to have a lab analyze all of these soil samples. The benefit of grid sampling is that it allows you to make very detailed maps of your field or even garden. You can map nutrient concentrations, pH, salinity, or anything else that you have your lab test for. This is very useful in precision agriculture where you want accurate data to custom apply fertilizers or lime in the exact amount needed across a field. Again, there's no real best method for soil sampling. You just have to pick the right one for your needs. Thanks again for tuning into the Science Basement. I really hope that you've enjoyed learning about soils. If you have any questions about soils or other science topics, please leave them in the comments below. I would love to make new videos to help you learn about the world around you.